Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Mary Charlotte Grayson, Director of Events for the National Indian Gaming Association. Thank you so much for joining us today for our exciting and informative webcast series, Tribal Gaming and the New Normal, with co-hosts Victor Rocha and Jason Giles. Today's discussion will focus on fires, floods, and hurricanes. Before we introduce presenters, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items to keep in mind. All audience members are on listen-only mode, which means you are muted. We will be monitoring audience engagement on the dashboard and do encourage you to participate by using the question panel. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. We are recording this webinar and you will receive an email with a copy of the recording so that you may listen to and refer back to at any time. This webinar, as well as others in our series, will also be made available on our website, indiangamingtradeshow.com, under the Education tab in the coming week. Now, without further delay, let me introduce Victor, Conference Chairman with the National Indian Gaming Association and editor of Pachanga.net, and Jason Giles, our Executive Director. Victor, take it away. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mary, for, uh, Mary Charlotte. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Victor Rocha. I'm the conference chairman of the National Game Association. My co-host is Jason Giles. He's the conference director. <laughs> so he's the executive director for the National Game Association, and this is the new normal. I apologize. I'm a little off this morning. I didn't get much sleep last night, so I'm still drinking coffee, hoping to kick in. Uh, our guest today, and actually our topic today, we're going to be talking about fires, floods, and hurricanes, disaster preparedness in Indian country with our special guests. Carrie Johnson, who's the Rural and Tribal Affairs Specialist for uh, the FirstNet program. Our uh, dear friend, uh, Eddie Oko, who's a safety manager for the Sequan Casino and Resort. And uh, uh, hopefully, uh, Jason Ramos will be dropping in from Blue Lake Rancheria. And unfortunately, uh, Bob Ekafee, who's the Chief of Police for the Oglala Sioux, uh, uh, Oglala Sioux Tribe, and Francis Alvarez, the Chairwoman of the Tribal Game Protection Network. Unfortunately, couldn't be here today, and uh, I'm going to be working on uh, uh, my elocution lessons as soon as this thing is over. So, good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? Great. Good afternoon, Thank you. Jason. Wow. Well, listen. You know, um, you know this. This. This is a very important subject because it seems. Uh, uh, you know, in my job with Pachanga.net, uh, it's my job to like look across Indian country every day and see what's going on and. You know, it seems that there just there seem to be more and more big disaster issues as I look across the country. Recently, we we've, we've had the flooding um, with in Oklahoma. You had the Muskogee Creek with their casino going under pretty much, and then you have uh, fires and floods in California. One of the reasons why I invited Jason Ramos was uh, because of what they're doing up in, in the Blue Lake Rancheria. There was an article last week where they sent a truck of of uh, supplies over to the Carrick tribe, another tribe up in Northern California, because they're, they're having fires and stuff like that. So this seems to be a constant need uh, uh, for the tribes uh, dealing with these natural disasters. Carrie, welcome, welcome to the show. Am I wrong? Is, is, is it just seems to be more and more of these, these disasters everywhere. It's just unreal sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. No, you're, you're spot on. And um, with the, the first snap program, so this is a, a, a interoperable wireless broadband network created for first responders and, and those who uh, support emergency operations. You know, in our roughly two and a half years of, of being, you know, operational across the country, we have seen a dramatic increase in requests for the, the portable deployable assets. Um, just as a point of reference, last year we received uh, just, just over more than 500 requests. Um, we've already hit that um, and more um, this year. And so as we see more and more first responders um, and tribal agencies getting on FirstNet, we're seeing more and more of those requests. But, but you're spot on that, that, you know, like never before, we are, are, you know, having to respond as an emergency community to a nationwide pandemic. Um, and then on top of that, a very active hurricane season um, in Iowa, we saw the, the massive derecho. Um, you know, we saw a very active tornado season in the southeast. 
um, and now with unprecedented wildfires in the West. So you're spot on. Um, it's it's really yeah that 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 derecho that was the one where they were the tribes were at the powwow and the hurricane hit them right in the middle of that powwow. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. No, it was, so, it wow. was kind of uh, like a, a, a inland hurricane. Well, you know, it's just. But, you know, one of the things that I'm always uh, impressed is that the tribes, and Eddie, you can join in, is that how the tribes have always risen to the occasions in, in these events, you know, whether it's, and actually, you know, we're right in the middle of one right now with this pandemic, Eddie, you know what I mean? And, and uh, it's, it's, it's scary to me. I, I can only imagine what our ancestors had to put up, and they don't even have half the resources that, that we've had, you know? How are you guys, how, do, what, how, how does your tribe, Eddie, and in your role with the tribe, how do you prepare for, you know, your, the inevitable almost, you know what I mean? It's like, when, when is your next, you know, my tribe and your tribe are very similar that, you know, we're in a semi-rural area and we always have fires, you know, every couple of years, you know, they burn down to the res and stuff like that. How do you, how do you prepare for this, Eddie? You're absolutely right. And Victor, thank you for, uh, for uh, you know, having me join in here with you guys today. It's a pleasure. But uh, I tell you, Saquon has, has uh, you know, has seen these fires now every year. It's no longer, um, you know, if it's going to come this year or not. It's, it's a matter of, it's almost, uh, California has been a year round now for wildfires. And uh, Saquon, of course, has our Saquon Fire Department. And they and their Saquon Police Department, our Child Police Department, and they use the FirstNet uh, program and the and the satellite phones, which is hugely important because we know not only have the wildfires that we're concerned with, but power outages. We had power outages last year when we had a couple of the thunderstorms. Um, also, with the high winds now, uh, our local San Diego Gas and Electric has been shutting down power in certain areas of rural El Cajon where we are. So we have to manage these situations a lot better uh, because what happened last year, our whole West Wing became dark. And I mean, we literally had to have flashlights and escort guests from in the middle of where they were playing slot machines and it was completely dark. Um, you know, so, so these things happen unexpectedly, of course. So you have to really, really know and have a really good evacuation plan. So because of these wildfires that we were new were coming this year, uh, we specifically created a planned evacuation, not only for the guests, but for our team members and the reservation. Because, I don't know if you know this, but buildings like casinos are probably one of the best places you want to be during a wildfire because they are very well sprinklered in case there is a fire. So you're very well protected in the structure. So we built our, our planned evacuation and our emergency uh, evacuation plan around specifically this this specific wildfire season. And I have it right here in, in, in front of me, this document that says uh, it's important to have your, 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 we have what's called a CERC committee, which is a Sequan Emergency Response Committee that consists of our GM, our VP of Casino Operations, Casino Shift Managers, VP of Security, VP of Facilities, v, uh, Chief Engineer, because they are the ones that are controlling the gas lines, the water, you know, our life safety system. If something fails, you have to have that backup generator. And that backup generator has to be full of diesel in order to be running for as long as time is, as the power is going to be out. So it's right. really important to, to have this communication and, and these plans in place. Well, you know, uh, again, it's a shame that, that uh, um, uh, Jason Ramos is near because they, uh, at the Blue Lake Rancheria, they've, they've uh, created a microgrid and how they've become this, um, this beacon of uh, safety, like you said, you know, for the community and, and, and Eddie, to, to, to uh, build on what you just said, I know for my tribe, you know, we've become that, that place where, you know, the community goes to, I think, Blue Lake, your place, all these. And you see that story again and again and again and, and, and in hurricanes. And, and by the way, Eddie, I'm glad you're not in an earthquake zone either. You know, I can only imagine <laughs> oh, of course. What, your, uh, what your list would look like over there. And actually, I'd be facetious. Eddie and I are both in Southern California. As you know, we invented earthquakes down here, so... Sure did. Um, you know, yeah. I noticed on the call we have uh, Chief Ekafi trying to get in. Chief, if you're in there, come on in. We'd like to see you. Um, but, you know, Eddie, it's just like, how, how do you plan for the uncertainty? Just keeping these type of programs, yeah, these type of documents, keeping them updated, you know. But go ahead, Eddie. 
Yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, a document is only as good as how you use it. I mean, I know a lot of the, the you know, OSHA documents, safety manuals that you have, or you know, sometimes they gather dust and these SDS sheets, you know, the safety data sheets for chemicals, you know, when it comes to safety. But now safety is at the top of everybody's list. You really have to, you know, use these documents. And you know what you, we, what you need to do is, is do practice drills. Um, practice drills that we do here at Saquon at least once a year for every department on emergency evacuations, making sure that they have that to-go kit with, um, you know, all kinds of bottled water, um, gauze in there, flashlights, scissors, a blanket, because you never know when you're going to need it and where you're going to end up if there's a triage and people are injured. So it's, it's, it's hugely important to have these drills every year um, and also to have um, when it comes to fire drills, creating a situation where you have to evacuate your hotel, for example. We did that this past February, pre-COVID. We had planned it uh, in February for our, for our second story of our hotel, our second floor. We, have, of course, had no guests during this time. We used our safety committee members and put them in, I think we had two or three of them in each room, and even in the ADA rooms as well. And we had to evacuate them. We had the fire department, our local fire department, come in uh, with their hoses up the stairwell and through the uh, the second floor and into one of the rooms to make sure that if the systems failed, that they could put out a fire and get to where they needed to. Another issue, of course, became how do you get into a door um, if if the person inside isn't opening it for you and 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 it's got the deadbolt and it's got the sliding lock. Well, we came up with a mechanism here in order to help our officers, our hotel management team, because it takes a village to protect, you know, our, our assets and protect the tribe. So everybody's got to be involved and know what they're doing. I have to tell you that we, you know, there was a few hiccups and that's why you do these things. And the hiccups had to do with when people evacuated through the emergency exits out onto the road. Um, there's a place uh, where we had them gather in a safe area away from the casino over by the by our pool where there's a big open lot. Well, unfortunately, some of the people who were designated to tell people to go that way, which we had told them to go back in through the casino to our event center. That is not what you want to do during a fire of a building is tell people to go back into the building. So these things are hugely important. If you can get these things figured out before, Victor, I can't tell you how important this is if you actually conduct these drills and, and put a lessons learned plan out there. Yeah, I think over at Pachanga, for us, it's like follow that screaming Indian over there. He's the one that'll show you the exit. You know, that, that would be me if you don't in charge. <laughs> So, uh, Carrie, Carrie, go ahead. You were going to say something? Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I think Eddie's really spot on. And, and one of the things that uh, we like to, to recommend is let's do our planning during blue sky days. Because if you wait until, you know, you're in the midst of a, a man-made or a natural disaster, um, you know, that's not the time to be trying to, to yeah, like Eddie was talking about, dusting off those plans and, and trying to, to you know, review them. And so, um, Where, where's, where's, where's the emergency app? Something like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so that is something that, that with FirstNet, kind of the way that we have designed the program is really to be in alignment with the National Incident Management System, um, the, the National Response Framework, um, really talk to, you know, who is uh, within your emergency operations center, um, who activates that tribal EOC, um, and, and we try to make sure that in advance during those blue sky planning times that, that we can integrate um, in that emergency support to role um, for communication so that we are integrated, uh, we understand um, the communication needs. Um, you know, many times we work in coordination like down uh, during Hurricane Michael in Florida, um, we actually were in alignment with those cut and toss teams. So as utilities were going in clearing the area um, we, we were in direct alignment with them as well as first responders um, to make sure that we could stage these these emergency assets um, another really good example of, of emergency training that we worked with the Quan um, was last year we did do a training and exercise event um, that was hosted at morongo um, organized by the intertribal long-term recovery foundation and the southern california tribal emergency management group um, and again it's good to, to test 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 exercise um, during those those blue sky days so that when you are in the midst of an emergency 
um, you, you know it, you have that muscle memory, um, you know the key stakeholders. If you're looking to do mutual aid, um, you have worked through what type of ways are you gonna communicate? Are there common applications, um, mobile apps that you plan to use? And, and all of that really needs to be determined um, before the emergency. And Carrie, I apologize. I, I apologize. I had James Ramos is trying to get in on the call, send the information. Okay. It was, well, it was, Carrie, go ahead, Jason. So, Carrie, I'll first to you, and then and then uh, over to Eddie. But uh, all this planning and training, you never anticipated doing it during a pandemic, right? I mean, I don't even know how you would begin to, to train during for a pandemic, uh, other than just actually experiencing one. So, what are the measures now? And have you received uh, federal help uh, regarding emergency preparedness during a pandemic? Mm -hmm. And I'll circle back around on that federal help uh, in a little bit here. Yeah, well, that, that's a great, um, a great question. As far as kind of the federal assistance, one of the things that we have been working closely with tribal stakeholders um, you know, are those who, who have received the CARES Act funds, um, who are looking to, to make investments in their emergency communications, um, in their broadband infrastructure. And so that's something that, that we are, are definitely having conversations with, with um, tribal stakeholders looking to use those CARES Act funds. Um, you know, some opportunities are things like um, the, these mobile uh, cells on on wheels. Um, we we have had interest, um, you know, from tribal nations in actually purchasing those. Um, other types of of connectivity solutions, um, even uh, so, with within the FirstNet kind of ecosystem of of devices and other solutions, um, there are purpose built devices called Sonum devices, and and these can actually be submerged in bleach and and disinfected. And so that's something we've also seen folks. Uh, needing to make some investments to make sure that their frontline teams um, have the necessary equipment, PPE, um, and, and so that's that's been kind of one key area. And then, you know, being in close coordination um, with with tribal nations, tribal EOCs, that as they are are staging their um, COVID-19 testing sites, their their EOC locations, field hospitals, that that we are in coordination with them to make sure they have the communications that they need. And one example um, was working closely with with Navajo Nation which as, as we all know um, ha has been really devastated by the coronavirus and has had one of the largest outbreaks in the country um, and we were able to to work with them to get um, first net cells on light trucks mobile cell sites uh, deployed to say Benito and Window Rock um, to make sure that that they as well as FEMA personnel who were on the ground uh, had the connectivity that they needed. What we did, and uh, I got invited through the Tribal Emergency Managers Association two years ago. I visited Morongo's EOC and Agua Caliente's EOC, and they are amazing. I can't tell you how important that federal assistance is to create these EOCs because they had these mobile units that they could take out to a disaster, and they had all the communication, radios, satellites, maps, um, all kinds of equipment in there that really, really it's its 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 its, its own little city inside of this. So. And not only that kind of equipment, but uh, vehicles as well, and uh, you know PPEs as well. So uh, the federal assistance that that you can get through uh, joining the emergency uh, tribal emergency managers association, or just knowing where to go to through FEMA and through Cal OES to get the resources, because they're out there for tribes. Every single year, there's millions of dollars allocated for emergencies. Uh, you know, it is a pain in the butt sometimes to go through the grant process, and you should have someone that knows how to do that. It's hugely important. But uh, I was very impressed with, with what they had over there, and we're working here in order to do that at Saquon as well. You know, we, we kind of, um, uh, what exactly is the FirstNet program, Carrie? Yeah, so, so the FirstNet, um, the concept behind FirstNet really stems from the communication failures that occurred during the 9-11 terrorist attacks, where you had multiple responding agencies using different radio systems that, that weren't communicating, as well as the, the commercial wireless networks that because of the flood of consumer traffic uh, were completely overwhelmed and, and you know, could not um, get messages through. And so 
Um, it was included in the 9-11 Commission report that, that we as a country needed a dedicated nationwide interoperable network for first responders. Um, Congress took action in 2012 and passed legislation that set aside a band of spectrum for first responders and then also created the federal FirstNet authority. Um, the FirstNet authority was then tasked in figuring out, okay, how do you make this nationwide network a reality? And they put together an RFP. Um, numerous entities responded to that. Ultimately, AT&T was selected as the private partner to work on this 25-year public-private partnership and initiative. So now we are about uh, two and a half, you know, three years into our, our, our initial five-year build-out of FirstNet, um, which involves adding the, the band 14 spectrum to tens of thousands of sites across the country, adding um, more than a thousand new cell sites um, in, in locations that, that have um, been identified as, as needing more communications for first responders. Um, we now um, have more than 13,000 agencies across the United States to have signed up. Um, and so really FirstNet is a network where first responders, police, fire, EMS, uh, 911, emergency management, your emergency department, healthcare personnel, um, they have the highest level of priority and preemption on the network. Um, but then uh, FirstNet is also available to all those important people who support emergency operations, including um, like casino security uh, personnel, um, COVID-19, uh, you know, contact tracers, public health workers, um, you know, even highway departments. Um, so, so all these critical people, um, I mentioned utility workers earlier on in this talk, um, you know, people who, who, in order for first responders to sometimes get into an area after a major windstorm or a hurricane, um, they play a key role uh, removing down power lines. Uh, school bus operators play a key role um, with evacuations. Um, so those are all the type of folks who are eligible for FirstNet and, and within tribal nations we've seen very strong adoption among tribal users. We're really excited about um, the expanded coverage that, that's coming to areas that have long um, had coverage constraints um, thanks to this public-private partnership. Um, and then the other big factor is that, you know, they have access to a, a dedicated fleet of, of deployable assets, so mobile cell sites um, that can be called upon um, when there's a wildfire and infrastructure has been damaged, or let's say, um, like another example is the Yankton Sioux Tribe, their police department uh, requested a first net deployable when they were staging a search and rescue operation, a very remote part of their reservation. So with first net, it's really just a common interoperable platform to support communication um, across agencies and, and really make sure that first responders have connectivity when and where they need it. Well, and, and Eddie, your, your, uh, uh, your tribe is, is part of this FirstNet group also, right? That's right. Right. Um, um, you know, first of all, let's, let's welcome Mr. Ramos. Jason, hi, can you, can you hear us? You got your mute button on. There he is. Oh, yeah, I, I can hear you. Wow, there you are. You know, first of all, Jason, welcome so much. It's, uh, uh, it's, this is an honor for me personally because I think as I told you over the phone, I've, I've been a big fan of your tribe and what you've done. And, um, you know, so welcome. Uh, Carrie, real quick, I just wanted to, uh, um, so how, 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 how much of this is in the field right now? How much is, is out there right now? Because one of the first things you said is that you mentioned 9-11 and then you mentioned that it wasn't done until 20, like 10 years later. So it sounds like government's operating at the speed of negative sound or something, you know? Yeah, so, so after the 9-11 Commission report came out, um, there was extensive advocacy across public safety disciplines to really push for Congress to take action. Um, again, that passed in 2012. Uh, the First and Authority then did extensive engagement to really ask public safety stakeholders, tribal stakeholders, you know, what do you want from this network? And, and that is really what informed that request for proposal. Um, AT&T was selected in, in 2017, um, and since that time, again, we've now seen, um, you know, pretty extensive adoption, um, 1.5 million connections on the network, more than 13,000 agencies. Um, so at least as far as since this public-private partnership has launched, we've seen really impressive 
um, build out and adoption. Um, our band 14 build out is, is more than 80% um, complete across the country. Of our more than 1,000 sites, we have more than 250 of those that are now on air, including um, actually uh, the Red Cliff uh, tribe um, in northern Wisconsin. We worked collaboratively with them to, to get a new site deployed. Uh, we recently turned up a new site in, in Martin on, on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, so it is really exciting to see, um, you know, thanks to this public-private partnership, this, this infrastructure truly being deployed and, and then seeing um, first responders, tribal nations, you know, actually putting it into use. Wow. Well, it sounds like something that, that, that was long overdue, especially with, you know, the, these reoccurring natural events. Uh, Mr. Ramos, again, you know, um, when I was doing my research, you know, and, and, and also in my role in Pechanga.net, my job as uh, the editor is to, you know, uh, read everything every day and, and, and to put out uh, Pechanga.net for almost, for almost 22 years now. And, you know, what you guys did in, in Blue Lake and, and just do my research again, it, it all came back again. And, and I'd like to read uh, a couple of the headlines here for, for our, our, our uh, uh, so la, la, what, two weeks ago, a month ago, baby. No, no, two weeks ago. Uh, Blue Lake Rancheria delivers food to Carrick tribal members devastated by sister fire. Uh, with casino and restaurant shutter, Blue Lake Rancheria cranks out meals for tribal elders during COVID-19 shutdown. Blue Lake Rancheria's tribe's microgrid helped neighboring communities during PGE shutdown. What are you doing, man? You're ruining the bell curve for the rest of us. I mean, you guys are just like, you know, it's it just, this is what gaming was supposed to be about, was to create the, the opportunities. And listen, you guys are a small tribe with, you know, you're not a, a, a great in Rancheria, you're not a Pachanga, you're a smaller tribe up in Humboldt County. But I know, you know, you guys are dealing with these wire fires and these environmental issues just again and again and again on top of this pandemic. Uh, can you tell us a little bit how about your tribe and how the community uh, and the tribe have, have done such a great job of working together? Uh, you know, for us, um, you know, and you're right, we're a small tribe, uh, small land base, only 100 really acres here. For us, it started back in really, we started doing energy efficiency things. So we see, we see our emergency response kind of going glove in hand with uh, the issues we deal with climate change and, and wildfire and all those, all those other negative impacts of uh, increased global temperature. So we started back just doing energy efficiency uh, measures uh, in the hotel. When we built a hotel, we kind of baked that in there. You know, at some point, we, we knew that, and we, we saw this from really our experience um, with, uh, with fish in the river, right? We, on the Mad River, we used to have salmon runs every year. By the time we got into the late 1990s, they were, they were getting more sparse. So we have a connection to the land. We understood that things were being different. And by the time we got into the mid, you know, the, the first decade of the 2000s, um, you know, we haven't had a decent salmon run on the Mad River since about 2014, and they only happen now uh, hit, hit and miss. So, um, you know, as far as that cultural resource goes, it's very important to my uh, tribe and our, uh, our tribal membership. So we knew that something was different. Our tribal government made the decision that we were going to um, really um, kind of refine the way we did business. We really see as a government, we really see um, we really see five lifeline sectors with energy and water, transportation, commu communication, and I inter internet technology and food. So we've developed programs around all of that. And you're absolutely right, Victor. We would have never been able to do any of this with, if it weren't for tribal go government gaming, right? That's that, that's the economic en engine that allowed us to do these things. So we developed a hazard, hazard mitigation plan. Um, a number, a series of other plans. And as we build projects, we started putting those, we started putting infrastructure to help um, not only just for, for, mitig for to offset our CO2 with mitigation, but also for adaptation for the future. Like we didn't see, we didn't foresee when we built a microgrid, now we have two of them in operation, we're, we're building a third one. 
we didn't see or we couldn't forecast that there was going to be public safety power shutoffs. We were just hardening our own infrastructure to make sure that, you know, in case of uh, flood, wild, uh, the flood or earthquake, we could we could do it. We don't have too many wildfires, although we saw one across the, the freeway in 2017 from our from our facility. So it's really about our tribal government's will and planning that really pushed us through. Um, so the way that it started for us, and I'll be brief, um, the way it started for us is we spent some of our uh, revenues on developing a robust Office of Emergency Services, and we also have a Department of Energy and Technologies, which oversees the microgrid stuff and our biodiesel facility, some of those other things. And we have those, we have those groups working together uh, to develop and to make sure that when we go to build new projects that we that we have that we have the future uh, in consideration. So we we built that micro the first microgrid. You know, it's a four it's almost a 500 kW system with a two megawatt hour Tesla battery. What that really means for folks out there is that uh, before we have to kick the diesel and it's in conjunction with a diesel one megawatt diesel generator. But before we ever have to kick that diesel generator on, we can last six eight hours just on battery and solar. And then the other thing it does economically for us is that in periods of time where we don't have uh, the threat of power safety shut off or the electricity is not off, that we can save some money because we can run solar and battery during the peak hours of operation and save on our PG&E bill. And we save a couple hundred thousand dollars a year that way. Go ahead. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, I know, you know, and what people don't understand is that you're you're in an area where up in Northern California, they made the announcement the other day that they're going to start shutting off the electricity up in Northern California because of the wildfires, because of the liabilities. A lot of these 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 fires, these massive fires in the last couple of years, have been caused from from uh, uh, um, the power poles and stuff like I mean, just again and again and again. But what was amazing about Blue Lake was that you guys. Uh, all of a sudden have become the, the community center, you know. Um, um, you, they, they shut the power off to reduce fire, uh, fire uh, risk of wildfire. The next thing you know, the local newspaper was setting up in your, in your conference room. You had the uh, Health and Human Services sending uh, um, uh, sick patients and you, and you were taking crit critically ill patients in your hotel room. So all of a sudden, you guys have become the center of this community, the only place with electricity, the only place with running water, probably. I mean, it's just really an incredible story that I keep trying to share with everyone who's willing to listen. So that's why it was so important for me to have you on here. And uh, again, Jason, so, you know, again, I've said this before and without sounding cliche, but, you know, when we're doing this right, you can't tell where the reservation ends and the community begins. And I think Saquon's doing that. And I think Blue Lake Rancheria is doing that. And what you've become is, you know, and, and if, if you look at it in, in, in the arc of history, you know, we've become uh, what we used to be the victims. Now we're the first responders, right? Yeah, you know, um, as part of our, our strategy, we have a thing called the, the RTIC, which is the... Um, Regional Training and Innovation Center, and part of that we we hosted the first FEMA Advanced Academy. So the so the director of OES for the county went through our program to get certified, right? So we sent a bunch of our own people through that Advanced Academy. It's a five week program to get certified in emergency management, and those are the people you know behind the scenes that coordinate. Uh, with the USDA to get food. Those are the people that coordinate with CRIB. We're a regional testing center, right, for COVID testing center. Those are the people that are on the on the phone with neighboring tribes. We have tribal members from Inland right now. We got about 20 hotel rooms blocked off and our OES, along with uh, the uh, Hoopa OES are working together to relocate some of those sensitive populations that are that are in the smoke that can't be in their homes. They're over at our hotel right now. Wow. Um, yeah, so those are the sorts of things when you have a robust uh, set of uh, uh, OES professionals that you're able to do. That's not me and that's not myself and the tribal government, right? Those are things that we planned and we spent money on. Um, and, you know, those monies came from our tribal governmental gaming, right? Uh, so that's why I always kind of circle back to that. 
we would never be able to do any of this if it weren't for that, right? How how how, how big is how big is your casino? It's a uh, seven, it's a seven hundred machine casino. It's got about sixteen table games. Got a little poker room. Uh, the hotel room I think is hundred and two. So it's kind of a medium size. It's not it's def, it's not a, it's not a super giant facility. We do have a little special events room, which is a sprung sprung structure. That sprung structure acted as a uh, as a relief shelter during the power public safety power shutoffs. Um, uh, PGD actually brought a tent out later too during the second one. You know, and right now that that uh, people don't know this, but right now um, that our our special events center is acting as a as a this, it, it, we call it the homework club, but the, uh, we're partnering with the local Blue Lake School because we're going to have two different programs: one for employees so they can bring their kids during the day and they can attend school, and the other one is a school program so that kids in the local community, both native and non-native, can can attend uh, a pod where they can be uh, physically distanced. So those are the sorts of things that COVID have brought on, and those are the sorts of things that our OES professionals are able to coordinate. Uh, kind of moving forward, you know, we have a partnership with OE, the, the Office of Emergency Services for Humboldt County. We've provided to date about 25,000 meals to them, uh, packaged frozen meals, so that they could distribute to the homeless um, that they have uh, in different quarantined areas here in the county. So, you know, when you were absolutely right, when it comes to emergency response, we're, we're, we're looked at in our, especially in the Mad River Valley, we're the place to go. But we're also partnering with uh, with our county, and uh, a lot of the a lot of the folks that are over in county OES went to uh, went to training with our OES professionals. So it's kind of name to name basis, and uh, that's been uh, really beneficial for us. Wow! You know, Victor, just recently here at Saquon, we had the you know the fires um, over here in El Cajon and East County, and uh, they were approaching Saquon. But luckily, the you know the Santa Ana winds didn't come this way, and our fire department was out there fighting these fires and letting us know. Oh, I just want to mention one really critical thing to have is an emergency mass communication system for not only the, your employees and, and, and for the guests, but for your tribal reservation and the residents, because they all need to know when it's time to go. They all need to know, and, and, and because you don't want to have to go door to door, which is what our tribal police department is going to do anyway, but you don't want to have to go and, and help people, you know, that either um, are in wheelchairs or are elder, and they're going to have a hard time getting out when time is of the essence. That is, that is so so critically important when it comes to that. And the type of partnerships that we've created here at Saquon, it's funny, Victor, you mentioned, you know, where does the reservation begin? Where does the community, you know, begin and end? Uh, the, the Red Cross called me uh, the night of, of the second night of when the fires were declared the emergency out here. And they said, Eddie, we need somewhere to put these evacuees. Do you have anything at Saquon? Can you help us? We are at wit's end. We don't have anywhere else to put them. I made some calls and was able to get 16 families at the U.S. Grant downtown um, at no charge to them for, for two nights. Uh, it's critical for these families that have nowhere else to go. No, the shelters were at, at, you know, busting at the seams as well. There was nowhere else to go. So having those shelters, you know, and, and having the community. We also uh, housed the, the, uh, the, uh, fi the Cal Fire firefighters. All came here to Saquon and all free rooms here. They all stayed. We had a, a bunch of floors, you know, that uh, we reserved for them and they all stayed here. You should have seen the scene that we had here with the, you know, all these firefighters coming through the casino and going up to the hotel. It was quite a scene, but that's the kind of, uh, you know, heart and, and, and uh, kind of community involvement, involvement that Saquon has. And the tribe is really, really generous as well. You know, because as you know, the casino is uh, like, like you said, the engine that runs their their economy, and they're so generous with uh, giving back to the local community and and uh, San Diego in, I think, in general. So, Carrie, uh, a question to you of, 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 at the federal level. One of the things NIGA, NCAI, and it really was an NCAI initiative uh, years ago, was to get the federal emergency management agency FEMA to give direct grants and aid to tribal governments and not go through the state governments and we got that change into law uh, Congressman Denham who's no longer a congressman in California was instrumental in that also 
Also, Victor's favorite congressman, Devin Nunez, he deserves some credit for it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, but the Karen farmer? has, and it's always like, you know, all the things NIGA and these national tribal organizations do, it's always the one thing that nobody really paid attention to that ends up having the most impact in Indian country. And this FEMA one, I think, is one of them. And it's something out of my wheelhouse and out of NIGA's wheelhouse. But uh, how has that worked? And probably Jason and, and Eddie, you could speak to it too. Uh, how, how has that worked when FEMA has come in and getting, getting the money to the tribe and, and all of that and these shelters, all that kind of stuff that FEMA has at its disposal? Yeah, Can you speak yeah. to that, Carrie? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so that is something that specifically like with the, the coronavirus, um, there was emergency assistance um, that was made available as this was a nationwide emergency. So that was one, one stream of funding that we definitely did have uh, tribal nations and tribal public safety agencies um, interested in also um, within the Homeland Security Grant Program. Um, as, as you noted, um, you know, there has been a, a portion of, of that grant program set aside um, for tribal nations. Um, and, and the main way that we work, work with tribal stakeholders is that, um, you know, there are many who are, are interested in, in accessing those, those key federal funds so that they can make investments um, in technology solutions and expanding their use of FirstNet. Um, things like, and, and uh, Chief Ekafi um, over at, at the Oglala Sioux Tribe, one of the things that they've really um, been able to leverage with FirstNet um, is, is having connectivity within their squad cars. And so they um, themselves patrol just a, a enormous landmass, um, the size of, of roughly Connecticut. Um, and thanks to FirstNet and having connectivity in their squad cars, um, their tribal um, OST Department of Public Safety um, dispatch can actually see the locations of all of their officers on patrol. And so that if they get an incoming call, um, you know, dispatch can quickly have that situational awareness so they know who's going to be the fastest to respond. Also within the squad car, um, their officers now can push a button if they are in a, a dangerous situation and need backup. Um, and, and that's sent both to the, the um, Department of Public Safety dispatch as well as those surrounding officers. Um, and, and so OST, um, you know, they, they've indicated that they're also um, looking to, to apply for some of these funds to, to further expand some of these connectivity solutions. And, and we have many um, tribal nations that are similarly doing that. Um, there is free grant assistance, complimentary grant assistance um, through allthingsfirstnet.com. Uh, they have a grant expert who can sit down, um, understand, you know, what exactly are, are you hoping to, to, you know, invest in, purchase, um, and kind of can help, you know, identify what's a, a, a eligible grant um, and even kind of assist with, with some of that um, uh, uh, kind of the requirements for, for the grant application. And so that's a great resource that anyone who's interested can go to allthingsfirstnet.com. Um, there are some educational webinars posted. They, they regularly have um, educational trainings, um, but that's a great resource and, and one that, that we often point folks to. So Eddie, how, how difficult was it to, to, to get involved in FirstNet and stuff like that? And what, what was your motivation to, to, to get involved? Well, we were seeing that, you know, when, when communication fails, you want to make sure you get a solution that will not fail. And FirstNet does not fail. This is the system that you want, that you need, because I'm telling you, when your cell phone goes down, when email goes down, when your computer goes down, you're going to need some way to communicate. And during, during you know, emergency is the most critical moment. So you want to make sure you have these uh, systems in place and, and it's out there. I mean, FirstNet has, has been brought up through, you know, the, 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 the U.S. government. They have all these funds and they've created partnerships with Indian country. And we need to reach out together to make these things happen. Um, I know we've been really fortunate here at Sequant to be able to, to work with Carrie and her team, our uh, police chief, Bill Denke, you know, a, along with, uh, you know, our tribal council here. They're, they're very forward thinking about what could happen, what's going on around us, and how to protect the community that we have here. Um, and also, you know, Indian country 
as a whole. That's why I attend these emergency management you know, meetings. Um, right now, of course, through COVID, we're doing it online or through phone calls, but it's so important to get involved, to get yourself involved so, so you have options. Um, I'm telling you that, that these, ins, these, uh, these, what Carrie offers and her team offers, you know, I sound like a salesman, but I'm telling you, it's, it's the way to go. You have to do something to protect because you don't want to be in the emergency and then start looking around for ways to communicate with your fire chief, with your police department, you know, and what are you going to do with your management team at your casino? You know, we have a system here. We have an incident command center where our dispatcher immediately is going to call through that first net phone, that satellite phone to make sure that everybody who's on that, uh, the, uh, the Sequan Emergency Response Commission or committee, which is our GM, our VPs, our you know facilities director, safety, police, fire. They're going to meet in a certain area, and they're going to discuss what is going on. You know, you have maps in the room. You have land. You you have uh, maps, building diagrams. You know, you need all of this stuff pre-emergency. That's why you know all of this preparedness is is so important. And it, it's not just the only thing that that person that offers. Um, they have a lot of more. Uh, you know, things that, that you can work with. And uh, I, I think they really need to be, you know, we, we need to push this out there to, for Indian Country, Victor and, and Jason. I really think well, this is, is necessary. Thank you for doing this because this is going to get the word out. Hey, Jason, so what, what happens to your casino in all this, in all this, in, in the middle of a disaster, what happens to your casino? Yeah, so uh, COVID did shut us down for a while. We were down uh, for about four months. I think we opened for a couple of days, and then the uh, the, the cases spikes were we shut back down. We're back open now, but the casino was just uh, empty. Yeah, there was just shut down there for a bit. So, but my tribal government was pretty good at saving her money, and so we were we knew we could make it through and pay our OES professionals. Um, what, what I mean, I mean, like, like during during, during the 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 wildfire, during the shutdowns and stuff like that. You know, oh. the 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 idea is that you 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 get the electrical. It's supposed to keep the hotel running. It's supposed to keep the you know the lifeline to the casino, and yet it becomes something else. It becomes this emergency center, this mm -hmm. this this spot where everyone in the community can go again. You know, you go to the reservation. You know, at my yeah. reservation, we have we have a place called the Great Oak, and our ancestors would go to the Great Oak in times of duress and stuff. And it kind of feels like these casinos are now becoming the Great Oaks for all the tribes, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's definitely the case. I see what you're asking. Yeah, when the power goes out, we automatically island. And then we start watching the diesel reserves at our gas station so that we can make sure we can power the di to power our diesel generators. Because uh, we know it's gonna last for a few days and the solar battery is gonna go off. But everybody in everybody in our community, and we have a sm this small community of Blue Lakes, got about a couple thousand people. But you'll see people just come to the parking lot and hang out. That's why we open the that's why we open the shelter. Uh, we also coordinate with um, our local uh, city of Blue Lake community uh, emergency response team, those search teams. We have our own version of that too, and they interact. And then they go out in the community for people that we know are special populations and check on them or bring them food or whatever the task may be. But definitely this is seen as a meeting place. And, you know, uh, other than some, other than the kind of, you know, big special events we've ever had out in the back field or something during pu public safety power shutoffs, there'll be this, where the, the parking lot's full. I mean, people are well, here. And also also, also it's in the in the in the, the press democrat that you guys had you know your gas station was the only one working for miles and stuff like that so you guys are the only yeah. place that has the lights on that so what you're saying in case of a zombie apocalypse blue lake is where you want to be that's what you're saying right yeah and you know that brings its own challenges for us we have and that's and that's something i wanted to mention before you know we make zombies? sure that, no not the zombies but oh, okay uh, that was me kind of the interdisciplinary uh, nature of, of OES response, right? So we have, we have a fire department, we have a, a cross-deputized police force, we've got a security force for the, for the casino, and then we have all these other tribal governmental employees. And what we do is make sure that they're all trained in FEMA ICS up to, I think, the 300, 400 level, so that when the time comes, uh, because we're not used to having, I mean, during the, during the power shutoff, uh, we had 15,000 guests a day in cars trying to buy gas, and we and it's not a big gas station. 
Wow. So we've got six, we got four miles of traffic to, to deal with or a couple miles of traffic to deal with and try to try to circle through the parking lot. And then we have people, you know, who have to tend to the gas pumps. At one point we could only sell, you know, we had to ration gas. So you could only buy $20 worth of gas because we are, <laughs> we're, co we're coordinating the deliveries with sales, right? So everybody gets something and we have to put some of the diesel sales to the sides for first responders. Um, and we get those calls coming in from both the university, first responders, uh, Cal Fire, the uh, local fish hatchery. Those are all groups that call us and say, hey, we're going to need some the diesel. fish hatchery? <laughs> the fish hatchery? You Listen, we're bringing a bunch of, I, I need a, a room for 7 million row. You what know they do? I, mean? <laughs> they have, they, I didn't know about it either. They have to. They have to run those pumps, right? And or else there's a fish die. Right. So yeah, yeah, part yeah, of yeah, that yeah. is their backup diesel generator. I had no idea. It just comes out of the blue. But you, you get these calls coming in. So it's that coordination where we can, you know, train or have all those folks trained, and we can switch up OES teams because after a couple of days, people get tired, right? Of these shifts, and that yeah. way also people know how to what their job roles are, and they can go out and execute the mission whatever that may be. So, so on, on that incident, what, what did you guys do at your casino? Do you shut your casino down? Do you leave the slot machines open so people can still at least, you know, have some type of diversion? You know what I mean? Victor, people still need a, people still need a, a venue for entertainment. Yeah. So we do. keep, of course we keep it open. We keep it open. There'll be some folks in there. There's a lot of, there's a, the restaurant traffic. So of course we have to make some we have to, you know, uh, try to coordinate that. There's a lot of other folks coming down because, you know, they don't want to barbecue because they're, you know, maybe their appliances don't work. Or the other piece about that I never realized is that uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of folks in the, uh, the community who have medications that need to be refrigerated. Wow. And we had to make a change there and convert part of our uh, one of our uh, convenience store coolers into a. Uh, a place where you could store med your their medications and then have a system where they could come in and check out their medications. So those are the things that you kind of do on the fly that you never that you never see coming that you learn from those events. That's you know what, James, that's amazing. It really is. And the, it just really goes to show you that how you guys really have become the heart of the community. You know what I mean? And and you know, where do you go? And and again, you know, the irony is not lost on me and 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 who we are in, in our in our in our journey and i really just i'm really so happy that you guys could be here and that we could tell this story because it is a really important story not a lot of people know what what has happened up in blue lake and how important your your tribe has become to the community and, and again you have become the heart of this community and 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 again eddie uh the same goes with you and carrie uh we really appreciate you guys uh what you're doing and jason you know what can we do to help other tribes do this you know i think you know having these webcasts are very important but i think it's important that we share this information and you know the first net and you know the 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 you know what jim's talking about about you know uh freedom you know with being tethered to electrical services and having your independence and it's really what they're talking about at the root of all this is the independence you know yeah one thing, uh, Victor, that needs to be done is, uh, you know, from our perspective at the Gaming Association, we, we do need to make this more of a, get it incorporated with active shooter, all, all these types of emergencies uh, that a, a casino could face, and also all these types of areas of assistance that a, a casino could, could be. I, like I didn't even, until Eddie mentioned it, you know, a casino is a perfect place to, to seek refuge from a fire. and it's no different than like the school kids schools around here that says tornado shelter and all that kind of stuff yep. uh just to have those plans in place so we, we definitely need more, more exposure i we, we need to give nci credit they do focus on this uh, a fair amount at their conferences and they bring in the experts from the federal government and uh and it has been out there and, and i think tribes are doing a good job taking advantage of what what's available under federal law right now but um you know with turnover and then certainly with this pandemic, uh, we, we need to revisit again. So uh, it'll definitely be on our agenda if we can ever get conferences again. So 
Right. Well, you know, brother, we, we, we'll be talking about that. And, uh, you know, we have a while to be, get up to here. Um, you know, Eddie, you know, we have about five minutes left. Could you uh, give us a little final statement and in, in about what you guys are doing over at Saquon and how you plan on, on, on uh, even building on your success? Well, not only here at Saquon, but uh, Saquon has allowed me as the safety manager to, uh, you know, I'm uh, the chairman of the National Indian Casino Safety and Security Association that has now over 500 members, and we have about 40 tribal casinos that are involved. So we share information, and that's what it's about, sharing best practices, uh, sharing policies and procedures, because that's how we're going to learn from each other. So through webinars that we're also doing and hopefully next year having uh, more conferences, uh, you know, they've allowed me to, uh, you know, in the past couple of years, uh, I was involved with TGPN as well. And I was able to travel and I was able to, to you know, help with some of the NIGA conferences and, and go out there and, uh, and share the information because that's what we have to do. Unfortunately, during COVID, a lot of our colleagues have been laid off, um, have have not come back to their jobs, unfortunately. Um, and hopefully, you know, we, we need to reach out to those that are coming back and those that are, uh, um, you know, maybe are taking on more tasks than they would have earlier. So it's, it's uh, you know, Saquon has really pushed me to uh, to continue doing this uh, with our new management team that, that we have here. Um, um, uh, our new uh, general manager, Rob Sinelli and our casino VP of operations, uh, Doug Vogelay, they came from Las Vegas, from the Venetian. So they bring a lot of amazing and, and great experience from uh, you know, the issues that they've had over there, not only in, in gaming that, that they brought amazing uh, skills to, but to the emergency issues that were involved. Of course, you know, active shooter, that, that happened in Vegas a couple of years ago. We just had the third anniversary of that massacre that happened over there and uh, you no know, other at Mandalay Bay. And, our uh, VP of food and beverage actually was the um, director of food and beverage when that happened over there at Mandalay Bay. And I'm hoping to to get him on one of these webcasts soon to talk about his experience and uh, you know what what we can learn. So uh, Saquon has done a lot for you know Indian country for like you said the community and the resources that they provide um, not only through me but through uh, NIGA being partners with NIGA and being on the board or I think being members not on the board but being members. Um, and also with CNIGA, I want to mention CNIGA, I think it's coming back to Saquon. They're going to try and do either a virtual or an in-person event in February. And we're looking forward to having some, uh, some, some speaking engagements there too. And some interesting topics, like you said, Jason, on wildfires and active shooter, um, as well as COVID. Right. right. Well, you know, Eddie, th thank you so much. And, and definitely tell the child, we appreciate them sharing you and your knowledge with the Indian country and, you know, we rely on, on, on you and appreciate all that you've done. And, you know, Frances was supposed to be here and she's the chairwoman of, of a Tribal Gaming Protection Network. And I know she would have had more uh, uh, to add to this conversation, but she couldn't Definitely. be here. But I'm not as pretty as she sure. is, but I'm sorry about that. I don't know about that, Eddie. With that background behind you, man, you look <laughs> like, you know. Uh, Carrie, my friend, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we appreciate uh, you coming and tell us your story about FirstNet and its importance to any country. Um, we'd like to, how'd you like to wrap this up, my friend? Oh, absolutely. Well, just thank you for, for providing this, this forum and opportunity. Um, you know, in closing, FirstNet is, is a first responders network. It, it's those who, who support emergency operations. So this, this really should be looked at as your um, dedicated network. We need to hear from you about what are your expectations now and into the future. And that's really what's going to inform how FirstNet evolves. Um, you know, I, I think Eddie was spot on with talking about, you know, sharing best practices. Um, you know, FirstNet it can be looked at essentially as, as a a cell phone service dedicated for first responders, designed for your needs. Um, you know, we do have those satellite assets that can be called upon when needed um, during the power shutoff. We've been working closely with, with tribal stakeholders, other state, local, federal stakeholders, um, with deploying uh, generators to keep cell sites up. Um, and, but I, I think it really comes to, to sharing those best practices. We, we have some really exciting use cases uh, we're working with a tribal nation in Arizona that's looking at, at FirstNet as the tool really to bridge its communications between its tribal police department as well as its um, tribal casino. Um, so, so it's things like that, sharing, sharing those type of, of use cases. Um, we look forward to when we can finally get together in person again. 
um, a couple years ago, we were at um, NIGA. Um, we also invited one of our, our application kind of solution partners, um, Mutual Link, that, that has done a lot of work um, in the gaming industry, um, specifically in, in New Jersey, um, and, and showcasing their platform with sharing video, sharing situational awareness. Um, the casino controls, you know, how and, and to whom they're going to share that with. Um, but with that, the reliable connectivity with FirstNet, that it just really opens up the, the range of, of, of uh, kind of capabilities and tools that you have at your disposal. Um, so just thank you for, for this opportunity. Um, we want to hear from you. Um, you're an important uh, user stakeholder group uh, within the, the FirstNet family. Um, so look forward to, to working with you to really make FirstNet a success and make sure it meets your needs. Thank you so much, Carrie. We really appreciate you coming on the show and, and, and sharing the information. Mr. Ramos, again, thank you so much. I want to thank your tribe for all the work that you're doing up there. Um, so what, what does the future hold for, for Blue Lake, sir? What, what, how are you going to build on your success? Well, um, I think we're going to continue, you know, uh, I, the first thing I'd like to say is that we're going to, that all tribes on the call need to work with other tribes to try to take a look at their, you know, their planning documents, climate, climate ad, adaptation plans, strategic energy plans, hazard, hazard mitigation, emergency plans. I know, and I know Eddie's on the call, that when we were setting up our police department, Saquon helped us a bunch with some of our foundational documents. So. Those are, that's the kind of cooperation that helps everybody. Uh, when you look at Blue Lake going forward, we're building a, a facility that's called the Toma Resiliency Center. It's a $7.8 million project. It's gonna house our Resiliency Training and Innovation Center program. So we're, when COVID clears, there's gonna be ability to have even more trainings here. Um, you know, uh, climate adaptation, we're going to do food sovereignty programs, it's going to be OES is going to be in there doing a bunch of FEMA work. So that's where we're going in the future. Um, we, you know, there'll be a regular schedule that goes out and I, I'm not sure if Naga gets it or not, but I'll make sure you guys get it. Before COVID hit, uh, we, you know, we have four or five trainings or three or four trainings a month. So um, that's where we're going. We're gonna continue the trainings. We're gonna continue the educational piece and that's what you can look forward from us. Well, sir, thank you very, very much. You guys done an amazing job. And, and again, you guys have become the role model for a lot of tribes across the country. That's why I wanted to share your story. I thought it was a very important story. And uh, uh, again, we really appreciate it. Again, thank you, our guests. Jason, uh, uh, next week we're gonna, we're gonna be doing uh, a follow-up on one of our previous shows with Matt Robinson and James Class from Class Robinson about the recent updates they made to their important white paper called Healing Tribal Economies, Updated Prognosis for Economic Recovery from COVID-19 in Indian Country. Uh, that please don't miss it. We will be finding out, you know, how the progress is doing and, and where we're going. So again, thank you, Jason, my brother. I'll see you in a, uh, probably tomorrow. Talk to you and Eddie. Carrie, Jason, thank you so much. And for all the attendees, thank you so much for Thank you, with panelists. Us next week. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. Oh, Thanks great. for having me. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. Thank you. Awesome.